Let me begin by thanking the Ateneo de Manila University and the Ongpin family for the opportunity to deliver the 19th Jaime Ongpin Memorial Lecture. I wish it were under more auspicious circumstances. As I speak to you today, the world is racked by a pandemic that has spread across over 200 countries and territories, a global economic slowdown that is likely the deepest since World War II, and a populist wave that has challenged democratic principles and human rights in many countries. If crises offer an opportunity for deeper thought and deliberation, then I hope this lecture is a contribution in the direction of resilience and building back better. My presentation today will draw on my research and professional work in the past two decades. The ideas herein benefited from many research and professional partnerships, too numerous to mention here. But let me at least acknowledge friends and colleagues in the Office of Development Studies in UNDP headquarters, the Social Policy and Economic Analysis Unit in UNICEF headquarters, both in New York City, and also the Rizalino Navarro Center for Competitiveness in AIM, and finally, the Ateneo Policy Center in the Ateneo School of Government. I am grateful for their camaraderie and collaboration. I will begin this lecture with a discussion of economists' love-hate relationship with inequality. What we were taught in Intro to Economics is not necessar necessarily what is reflected in the most recent literature which exposes just how double-edged inequality can be. I will then discuss the related features of oligarchy and dynasty, two elements of inequality in the Philippine context. Here, a similar schizophrenia emerges, as some people argue that there are good and bad of both. The best way to assess good or bad is by analyzing the impact of the patterns of leadership for political dynasties and the structure of the economy as regards potential business oligarchy. In my discussion, I suggest examining the development implications of the broad patterns of dynastic or oligarchic leadership, rather than remain fixated with individual oligarchs or dynasts. In both economic and political spheres, I argue that the competition is the real answer to ending oligarchy and dynasty, promoting inclusive growth and sustaining development. In his seminal paper in 1955, the economist and later Nobel Prize laureate Simon Kuznets observed that a developing country experiencing economic takeoff will likely first undergo increasing income inequality, later followed by diminishing inequality as the country reaches higher levels of economic development. Kuznets inverted U hypothesis has become received wisdom for decades producing economists that tend to tolerate or perhaps even celebrate rising inequality with the view that this is the price nations pay for economic growth and development. Hence, the canonical choice for policymakers is often between equality and efficiency or growth and redistribution. Professor Raul Fabella, our national scientist in economics, in his book, Capitalism and Inclusion Under Weak Institutions laid out the pragmatism that many Philippine economists have come to espouse. Referring to China's proliferation of billionaires, he notes, open quote, the Jack Ma phenomenon may be argued to have helped rather than impede poverty reduction in China. If so, I call it a fair exchange, end quote. Advances in the empirical literature, however, painted a mixed picture of the Kuznets curve in reality. Andrew Berg and Jonathan Ostry, economists from the traditionally conservative International Monetary Fund, empirically analyzed 140 countries spanning the 1950s to the 2000s in order to determine whether and to what extent inequality affects long-run growth. In a path-breaking paper for the IMF, they noted how higher income inequality may trigger social unrest and bar the poor from human capital accumulation, contributing to shorter growth episodes. Economists like Danny Roderick have since argued that context matters for determining good inequality versus bad inequality, alluding to the types of activities that lead to inequality yet have different implications on economic development. And 
It is this richness in context that should probably convince us today to shed any rigid dogma on inequality. Despite the mixed evidence, many economic development plans remain primarily focused on economic growth and poverty reduction, with very little messaging on inequality. Perhaps this belies an abiding anticipation of the self-correcting half of the Kuznets curve, once some level of economic development is achieved. Candidly, it is also a far more controversial goal to reduce inequality than to merely reduce poverty. In the Philippines, historically, the story has been more of a double whammy, a failure to reduce poverty more aggressively, even as inequality persisted. The official poverty figure prior to COVID-19 was around 17% of the population. Already early studies of the impact of COVID-19 predict that the pandemic could push at least 1.5 million Filipinos into poverty. Self-rated poverty collected by social weather stations shows that this was well over 70% during the tail end of the Marcos administration. And this has declined over time to about 50%. During the pandemic in 2020, it is likely that this figure has spiked again. But SWS has so far, so far not released an update that includes the lockdown period. Meanwhile, self-reported hunger has experienced historical high levels during the COVID-19 lockdown. If we are to append the data from mobile phone surveys of SWS conducted in 2020 so far. In late September 2020, SWS reported that self-reported hunger further increased under lockdown, reaching 30.7% at the national level. That's approximately 7.6 million Filipino households that experienced hunger in the previous three months. Visayas and Mindanao experienced more hunger during this period, with around 41% and 38% hunger incidents, respectively. Despite COVID-19 cases being concentrated mostly in urban areas in Luzon. And in terms of inequality, in the 1980s, the Philippines was ranked in the bottom half of most unequal countries. However, as of 2018, the country ranked in the top third of countries worldwide in terms of inequality. Unlike some of its more successful ASEAN neighbors that reduced both inequality and poverty in the past five decades, in the Philippines, inequality remained high while poverty reduction has been painstakingly slow. The result is a highly skewed income pyramid and a highly unequal society. According to analysis by Dr. Toots Albert of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, around half of Filipino households can be classified as poor and low income, living on less than 16,000 pesos a month. Meanwhile, only around 320,000 Filipino families live on 118,000 pesos a month or more. While the rising tide also lifted the incomes of poor and low-income households, the brunt of the increase was skewed in favor of the upper-income households and already well-developed regions. Taken together, this provides the gist of the country's imbalanced growth. This is clear when examining geospatial disparities in Philippine e income growth. In its recent analysis of economic growth across regions, the National Economic and Development Authority found evidence of divergence across regions across time. Already richer regions grew faster than poorer regions, signaling a growing development gap with strong geographic features. The national capital region and provinces like Benguet and Rizal actually achieved human development levels roughly comparable with fast-growing East Asian economies like Brunei and Malaysia. Nevertheless, other parts of the country, notably in Mindanao, lagged in human development. Human development indicators in Sarangani and Maguindanao are roughly at par with conflict-prone Central African Republic. A Filipino child born in Tawi-Tawi can expect to live up to 54 years of age, a full 19 years shorter than the national average, and 24 years shorter 
compared to children living in La Union province. If Americans have a saying that some are born on the wrong side of the tracks, perhaps we Filipinos will soon have a saying that millions are born on the wrong island. Luzon being the best place to be born in terms of human development prospects, and Mindanao the complete opposite. What accounts for the divergence in income growth paths across regions and across socioeconomic groups in the Philippines? What could be behind the bad inequality in the country? Structurally, there are many possible drivers of inequality since it could take shape in any number of ways. As Roderick reminds us on whether inequality is good or bad, he predictably says, it depends. I will focus on three main structural features that appear most relevant to the Philippine context. First is the disaster-prone nature of the Philippines and the propensity for non-inclusive recovery. Second is the worsening concentration of political power in the hands of a few political clans and the resulting conflict of interest in dramatically changing the status quo. Third, the prevailing economic structures where some sectors are still dominated by rent-seeking rather than competition, in turn resulting in an economy more known for exporting labor rather than generating jobs. Beginning with the first question and highly relevant in the present pandemic and economic slowdown, analysts rank the Philippines among the most disaster-prone countries in the world. It ranked ninth in the World Risk Index in 2019, which ranks 180 countries in terms of vulnerability to disaster risk and in terms of man-made factors that either build or weaken resilience to shocks. This is only a slight improvement from ranking second most disaster prone in 2014 and third in 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2018. There is considerable evidence by now on the unequalizing nature of disasters and crises, particularly when relatively richer sectors and communities have greater means for resilience, while already vulnerable communities and sectors tend to suffer the full brunt of these aggregate shocks. Geographically, there is also evidence that better governed and managed jurisdictions are also more resilient to crises. In my work with the United Nations over a decade ago, our research exposed how crises could exacerbate already existing poverty and inequality. In the three Fs, food, fuel, and financial crises of 2008 to 2010, many of the less developed and heavily indebted countries in the world and poor and low income communities bore the brunt of these aggregate shocks. And during period of austerity that soon followed, social spending and investments for the worst hit communities and sectors were often the first to be slashed as part of austerity measures. Yet budgets for military spending and infrastructure less so. Weak and non-inclusive recovery periods were in many cases characterized by children and young people dropping out of school, never to return, undernourished infants and children whose cognitive abilities would be permanently constrained throughout the rest of their lives, and countries whose taxpayers would be saddled with debt, having socialized the bailout of excesses generated by the financial sector or the corrupt or both. There are troubling signs that history is repeating itself under the present pandemic and economic slowdown. As I have argued in other forums, under lockdown, there is a deep divide between the technology haves and have-nots, creating a demarcation in resilience and crisis coping across students, workers, firms, and communities. Just to illustrate, several million students may be unable to enroll during the lockdown due to factors such as lack of connectivity. As Damien Barr, a columnist for The Guardian, amply noted, we are not all in the same boat. We are all in the same storm. Some are on super yachts. Some have just the one oar. Crisis responses that strengthen systems, such as those that provide adequate social protection, education, and health services, also preserve the economy's main ingredients for inclusive and robust growth 
for the longer haul. Otherwise, crises are accompanied by non-inclusive recovery, which then feeds the bad inequality that weakens some of the key factors behind long-run growth. If society fails to protect the vulnerable, crises can turn into inequality machines. A powerful study by Dr. Celia Reyes of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies provides further evidence to back this up. The bottom 40% of the population are very vulnerable to shocks, and many fall into and out of poverty. Millions of low-income households can easily slide into poverty if the main breadwinners lose their jobs, if someone gets seriously ill in the family, or with a bad harvest and natural disaster affecting them. The emerging science on natural disasters, economic crises, and health pandemics suggest one cannot relegate this all to bad luck. Crises are recurrent, and nations can and must prepare for them. Ultimately, these issues relate to the governance environment and to people's agency, on whether and to what extent policy and decision makers remain accountable to citizens. Unfortunately, such accountability is not always strong, as is illustrated by the growing empirical literature on the concentration of political power in the hands of political clans in the Philippines. This is the political side of inequality. My work on political dynasties began around 2011 when I repatriated and joined AIM Policy Center. Even back then, dynasties were already well studied in the political science and sociology literature. For instance, classic works include Power in a Philippine Municipality by Mary Holsteiner, Anarchy of Families by Al McCoy, Landlords and Capitalists by Temi Rivera. This was followed by path-breaking empirical work by Balisakan and Fua, Pablo Kerubin, and Dean July Tihanki. So some folks were surprised in 2010 why our small team of economists wanted to empirically examine political dynasties. It turned out that we were among the first to actually define and count dynasties, and from there empirically assess their socioeconomic impact in the countryside. We found very sobering evidence of what political inequality in the Philippine countryside looks like. Our data-intensive 2012 study of political dynasties in the 15th Philippine House of Representatives during the 2003 to 2007 period suggests that about 80% of dynastic legislators experienced an increase in their net worth during this period. About half of the sample did so well that their asset growth beat the returns from investing in the Philippine Stock Exchange. Updated figures reinforce this picture of privilege and power. Based on their self-declared statement of assets and liabilities and net worth, some dynastic legislators in both the lower and upper houses of Congress have experienced phenomenal growth in their wealth while in office. One dynastic senator saw his wealth increase by over 500 million pesos in just three years, while another saw her wealth increase by 1.9 billion pesos in just six years. Would it surprise you then that these senators were actually husband and wife? Among selected dynastic congressmen whose sal ends we tracked, we saw even more impressive growth rates in, in wealth, ranging from almost 200% to well over 300% in just over three years. If these congressmen were listed in the Philippine Stock Exchange, then they would put most blue chip stocks to shame. It is not necessarily bad for the already wealthy to run for office and to try to serve. On the other hand, if you become even more wealthy while in public office, that's another thing altogether. It's in this context that meaningful checks and balances must be put in place so that positions of power are not abused and conflict of interest is avoided. The benefits of public availability of sal and data probably outweigh any negative effects, especially if the increases in wealth can be properly evaluated in independent and fair reviews. Our studies tracking political dynasties also show 
that they win in elections by much larger margins of victory, probably owing to distinct advantages due to incumbency, and in some cases, the sheer number of family members already serving in office. In the words of one non-dynastic mayor who described this to me some time ago, Sa eleksyon, hindi lang isa ang kalaban ko. Lima sila. In our research, we have begun to track thin dynasties, sunod-sunod, and fat dynasties, sabay-sabay tumatakbo at nanunungkulan. If we define fat dynasties as those political clans with at least two elected members in office, then fat dynasties already dominate most of the local government. 80% of governors, 67% of congressmen, 53% of mayors, and 40% of vice mayors are from fat dynasties. Perhaps most troubling, and this is the main link to the income inequality side, more political dynasties in the Philippines are located in regions with relatively higher poverty levels. The image you will see in my presentation, for example, is the house of the resident fat dynastic political clan in Dinagat Islands, one of the poorest provinces in the country. It's often referred to by the residents as the White Castle. Do poor people vote for dynasties? Or do dynasties fail to reduce or even worsen poverty? Recent empirical evidence both in the Philippines and abroad suggest that the balance of causality flows from dynastic leadership to higher poverty. Yet, context here matters significantly. The dynasties to poverty link is likely significant in places where few checks and balances are left to temper the concentration of political power. Our ongoing study suggests the negative impact of dynasties is strongest in Visayas and Mindanao. We hypothesize that some form of competition, either in elections or through democratic checks and balances by stakeholders, for instance, business, media, academe, and civil society organizations could probably temper this negative relationship. After the crisis and political elements of inequality, the final aspect I would like to discuss relates to big business, notably the concentration of wealth that is associated with weaker competition in the market economy and the high risk of rent seeking. The common definition of oligarchy refers to a government run by a small group of powerful individuals. The Greek philosopher Plato, however, referred to oligarchs as greedy men, reluctant to pay their fair share of taxes. In oligarchies, the majority are poor and disempowered, while a small ruling class consolidates power. And they subvert laws to press their own interests over the common good. Hence, following Plato's definition, oligarchs could be in business or in politics. More recent conceptions of oligarchs refer to a wealthy class that exercise influence over government and the economy. Russia's Magnificent Seven, who controlled much of Russia's banking system in the post-Soviet Union transition period, and China's princelings, comprised of children of the original high-ranking communist officials, during the country's cultural revolution are among the possible examples. From here on, and just for clarity, I will refer to the group of potential business oligarchs since I am convinced that political dynasties can also fit the oligarchic bill. How dominant are the business oligarchs in their respective economies? Without condemning all wealthy people to the term, let us at least take a look at a few indicators of potential concentration of economic wealth and power. The Material Power Index developed by Jeffrey Winters of Northwestern University is the ratio of the average wealth of the top 40 richest individuals and the GDP per capita of a country. Using this indicator, China, Indonesia, and the Philippines stand out in this small sample of countries shown here in my figure. The extreme wealth of such a small group is not necessarily detrimental to development goals. The key issue here lie in the behavior of these businesses as regards competition. The structures that generated this wealth and the resulting disparity, 
and how this disparity affects the citizenry. Here, context really matters. The international research on business oligarchs paints a complex picture of their role in development. Even as oligarchic countries could grow fast initially, scholars like Daron Asimoglu of MIT contend that democratic systems will eventually outperform oligarchies because oligarchies create the structures and the incentives to protect against competition and stunt innovation. This is why I've come to emphasize identifying oligarchic behavior rather than any particular business oligarch. Stifling competition is the key oligarchic behavior to, to stamp out. However, a firm being large per se is not necessarily detrimental to inclusive development. As evidenced by the developmental role of big business among the Asian tiger economies. In the Philippines, oligarchic behaviors include obtaining government contracts using political connections, engaging in illegal activities to gain an advantage, such as insider trading, and capturing regulatory institutions in order to extract sweetheart deals. Scholars of Asian industrialization, such as Dr. Paul Hutchcroft and Anne Kruger, called this either booty capitalism or crony capitalism. In early literature on the Philippines, it was clear that political leaders gave advantages to business cronies in ways that also helped to consolidate political power. Rick Manapat's Some Are Smarter Than Others, for example, details how Marcos relatives and cronies benefited immensely, even as the country failed to industrialize and was eventually plunged into debt and economic crises in the mid-1980s. The corruption-tainted Bataan nuclear power plant still stands to this day as a testament to how debt-financed white elephant projects can burden millions of Filipinos and future generations while a few cronies and their political patrons benefited. Yet not all cronies have graduated to become full-fledged business oligarchs, as Dean July Tihanki of De La Salle University has emphasized. Many cronies come and go with political administrations, yet some big business players have demonstrated staying power across multiple political cycles. Their importance in the economy and their influence in politics have prompted some to suggest that they could be the real kingmakers. Just as my analysis of political dynasties focused on the effect of this leadership pattern rather than on specific families, my thinking on the presence and impact of business oligarchy is also focused on economic structure and anti-competitive behavior. To help illustrate this, I provide a snapshot here of the possible link between big business and economic structure. The figure shows the top 10 wealthiest individuals in the Philippines and the key economic sectors where they have invested in. Their names are not shown here, only their wealth ranking from first to 10th. The economic structure, structures are categorized into two broad groups, drawing on the extensive literature on rent rich, marked as red, versus more competitive sectors, marked as blue. Banking, construction, and real estate are among the rent rich sectors. Automotive manufacturing, education, and electronics are among the competition risk sectors. A ver visual map of the top billionaires in the Philippines compared to those in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand suggests that many of these nations' billionaires still have stake in rent-rich sectors. Thailand tends to stand out perhaps with less red and more blue in terms of its billionaires' economic footprint. A snapshot of how the billionaires in the Philippines compared to industrialized countries like the USA and South Korea shows a very different picture. The advanced countries in the map have wealthy individuals that are now largely focused on sectors with more competition and driven by innovation. Some of the wealthiest in the Philippines are engaged in banking, casino operations, and gaming, and real estate and property development. Very few of the wealthiest in the U.S. and South Korea have stake in these sectors. This is evidence of how the source of wealth could differentiate the kind of wealth 
creation and subsequent inequality in a country. One is based on innovation and productivity, while the other type of wealth creation is based on political connections, rent-seeking, and protectionism. This is probably a useful way of describing good inequality versus bad inequality. I argue here that alleged business oligarchs are not unlike fat political dynasties. Both enjoy size advantages that allow them to undermine fair competition, one in the economy and the other one in the political sphere. And while both are neither bad nor good necessarily, it is the lack of competition that sets the stage for potential abuse in business or impunity in public governance. Here I come back to my earlier point that oligarchs can be in business or in government. In some cases, these two spheres collide in ways that corrupt both the public and the private sectors due to rent seeking, corruption, and undermining key social, economic, and political reforms that could level the playing field. These behaviors are anathema to development and are, and are the essence of oligarchy. So when a politician calls out big business for acting like oligarchs, it seems to me a case of the kettle calling the pot black. Threats of government takeover and jail are less effective against the recurrent pattern of oligarchic behavior, since taking one out will only open the door for a new crony to take over if there are no deep reforms. Just like fat dynasties can be replaced by slimmer dynasties that eventually become fat too in the absence of deep political reforms. Perhaps one of the best cures for oligarchy and the rule of a few is the advent of strong competition in both the market economy and the political sphere. While there are many factors behind this, at least in the market economy, the key inputs include institutional innovations like a strong and independent competition authority. As long as this functions independently and effectively, it can contribute to a much more level playing field, pre preventing the abuse of market power among other anti-competitive behaviors. Incentivizing big business to seek export markets is another means to foster competitiveness. In addition, pursuing a more economic environment, a more open economic environment, could also welcome new players that bring more competitive pressure on big business, forcing them in the direction of innovation rather than rent seeking. What we have elaborated thus far are some of the possible channels that exacerbate bad inequality in the Philippines. The implications go well beyond economic policy and touch on the resilience of our democracy itself. Income inequality can have a major impact on democratization. Scholars argue that democracies are less stable in societies that are more unequal to begin with, in societies which household income inequality increases, and in societies in which labor receives a lower share of value added in manufacturing. Other analysts have emphasized how inequality produces political instability and democratic regress. Empirical evidence suggests that highly unequal countries tend to oscillate between democratic and autocratic regimes. Furthermore, redistribution appears to be more prominent in the economic policy discussions these days for many reasons, including the populist wave pushing back against globalization. Danny Roderick observes how the redistributive effects of liberalization get larger and tend to swamp the net gains as the trade barriers in question become smaller. Pushing globalization faster than our institutions could be set up to protect and give sufficient agency to the marginalized could generate backlash. Political institutions are particularly important to give agency to those on the marginalized end of the inequality divide. If they become voiceless and powerless, the ramifications could include populism. Thomas Piketty recently argued how many major political parties have been unable or unwilling to address inequality. As pockets of marginalized communities and sectors of society did not find credible allies in traditional political parties, they then sought alternatives. In came the populists. 
Thus, the link from inequality to populism establishes what could derail countries away from sustained growth. Some populists often favor unsustainable redistribution without deep and fundamental reforms addressing what caused the inequality in the first place. To sum up in this lecture, I outlined at least three main areas for possible reform engagement. Drawing on broad literature and my own experience in four think tanks across the last two decades. The first area seeks to promote more inclusive societies by building inclusive education, healthcare, and social protection systems as national public goods that promote social cohesion and resilience to crises and disasters. The second area focuses on promoting political and institutional reforms to help deconcentrate political power in the hands of a few families, and instead to empower citizens and to promote a more inclusive democracy. A third area tackles the reforms and regulations towards a more inclusive and competitive market economy, promoting greater competition where rent seeking is minimized while innovation, productivity, and job creation become the main goals for big business. In the final analysis, inequality is of interest not merely because of social preferences for less unequal distribution of wealth. Inequality itself can derail economic growth and development, breed populism, and weaken social cohesion. For these reasons, I believe the challenge of our generation is no longer simply about reducing poverty. Reducing inequality is the key to political stability, crisis resilience, and sustained economic development. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share these ideas with you today.